That's good. Anyway, what are we doing? There's a printout of a book that you can obtain online. Now, I'm not an advocate for anybody's product, unless it's good, and then my advocacy begins and ends with just telling you what I think about it. Um, professional Guide to Wheel Building, a complete reference for Cyclist 7th edition written by Roger Musson. Musson, I believe, is the pronunciation. If not, I apologize. Now, Roger Musson is an eminence in the world of wheel building. Um, you can pretty much Google wheel building tips and his name will probably come up. And if you get on any of the bicycle websites where people are talking about wheel building, his name will come up repeatedly. I don't know how old Roger is. He's younger than me. That's my guess. Um, but anyway, I want to talk about his book. Kind of a mini review of the book. Now, I bought the book. You buy it online. It's not in a bookshop or anything. You go online on his website. Will Building dot co dot uk okay and you send them some money it's not much it turns out to be about 12 bucks us dollars uh, nine gbp what's that get you that gets you the book which you can download and then it gets you access to the, one of the world's most knowledgeable wheel builders who will answer your questions um, because he's all about mentorship is what it turns out he's passing along the knowledge he's accrued over the past decades of his experience and this man's built any kind of wheel there is any kind of lacing pattern there is um, he's done it all and he's put it concisely, even though it doesn't look so concise. I've printed it out and downloaded it. It's not tiny print. Um, and it's about 130 pages, but the meat and potatoes part of the book, where if you want to build a, a wheel, and you've got the parts in front of you, and you want to know what to do now, step one through step eight. It's about 30 pages. Everything else is prelude. It teaches you all you need to know about components used in wheel building, techniques that apply for lacing patterns, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. See, kind of destroys a bunch of myths that are out there. And He's just matter of fact. He's not got a bullhorn or anything. He's just matter of fact trying to say, look, uh, there's plenty of really good people in the world making really good wheels. There's plenty out there that are making crappy wheels too. And you're gonna come across an awful lot of information and it might seem contradictory to what I'm speaking as Roger. I'm telling you what to do. But this, if you follow this, you're going to create really good wheels that you can trust and they'll be durable. That's kind of his approach in a nutshell, is there's lots of different ways of skinning a cat. Uh, this is what works for me. The guy's really good at it, so why wouldn't we want to learn from somebody like Roger? I did when I found out about him when I was starting to think again about building wheels. I used to build wheels. It was part of my job. I was a bike mechanic way, way, way back before uh, wheels were even round. It's been that long. About 40 years was the last time I built a wheel. And that past 40 years has been taken up 
with a very, very busy career, not in the bike shop. So I'm back at it. I want to get up to speed on everything that's new because there's a lot of new 40 years. So I started researching wheel building, and of course, you come upon this. This man, Jobst Brandt, Brandt, he's an engineer. He wrote this book. It's kind of the classic. In fact, Roger will refer to this book, and actually, in his book, has some quotations from Jobst, uh, answering people's questions about I read about this, what do you think? He says, well, no, um, here's what it is. So Yokes is kind of the gold reference when it comes to understanding the theory and the engineering behind it. Roger is the eminence when it comes to applied theory, okay? The practical aspects of wheel building. The bicycle wheel gives you that too. It would not hurt for you to have that book if you're at all interested in bicycle engineering, wheel building. Having both of them as a reference was really good because I read the bicycle wheel and that's more technical and there's stuff in there because it involves, you know, some higher level math that I never attained. Uh, I just had to kind of read through it and fathom it and get the, the logic out of it. I didn't have to be able to do the equations. That's what people like Yobst are for. Uh, I'm for cooking things and making them taste good. Uh, that's what people like I am for. Together, these guys wrote a hell of a story, so I boned up on the theory here first, read his techniques for building the wheel. He runs you right through it, the same sort of thing that Roger does. And then I read Roger. I was intent on not going back and forth. I think that could be a mistake. Um, all you need is this book if you want to build a good wheel. So 12 bucks, you download it and you have access to it forever. And if you update it, you have access to the updates. And if you have questions, you have access directly to Mr. Musson, who has answered several of my questions already. And if you have a problem with your account online or anything, he takes care of all that stuff, of course. So, real building, the professional guide to it. Now, let me uh, just kind of run through the book real quick, because I'm not going to attempt to do a Amazon.com book review or anything. If you just had access to this, the introduction, <laughs> there's so much in the introduction. It's pretty much every line you read There's good stuff in there. I'll just read a little bit about it. The information provided in this book is based on my wheel building experiences gained over many years, which started out building wheels for my own use, followed by owning a business that specialized in custom wheel building. I've run wheel building courses, so he's just kind of describing his bona fides. Then he writes, I have a theoretical and practical engineering background. I like to form my own opinion on what is good and what is bad. And he does, but he does it in a very matter of fact fashion. It's not like, if you don't agree with me, screw you. It's not here. That's not the tone at all. I evaluate all aspects of the building process and find the techniques that enable me to build wheels efficiently and to ensure those wheels perform reliably when used. And these techniques are fully tested because I build plenty of wheels and have lots of feedback on how they perform from team riders and customers. 
Now here's Roger, his person, come through. In the world of wheel building, there's no Einstein or some other lofty figure who we all look up to trying to tease information out of them or to admire their skill and knowledge, which seems like a long way in front of what we're currently doing. These individuals in the wheel building business do not exist. We're not in a field of science that has yet to make discoveries. You may think that superior wheel building knowledge and superior wheels exist because if you shout loud enough or use the most exotic tools, it can be very persuasive. But when it comes to building wheels, you can only go so far. Once you understand the concepts and can put them into practice, then there's nowhere else to go when you join the rest of us who are building perfect wheels. I want to convince you that you can be as good as any of the top wheel builders. He says, but if you do come across somebody like an Einstein, please let me know. He says, but I'm not that someone. Um, he's a modest fellow. Line after line, that introduction is just worth the $10. Then there's a quick start guide. Now the quick start guide kind of runs you through the eight steps that he describes in detail, exact detail, um, in the subsequent chapters. And you should read the quick start guide, but you should read the book because it's really not that hard. You can, you can study this stuff, and I printed it out so I could read it at my leisure in the evenings have a glass of wine, whatever. Chapter three talks about components and features of wheels, lateral and radial trueness, rims, hubs, hub design, spoke hole patterns, what the measurements mean, what to trust when it's printed on a wheel and what not to trust, why you need to make your own measurements of effective rim diameter and then a simple way to do that. Talks about spokes, spoke designs, different types of spokes, the dimensions of spokes. Chapter four, wheel design. Now that's a really good chapter and it's got more theoretical stuff in it, but it's, it's a thin chapter as you can see. Um, and he talks about spoking patterns and he kind of explodes some myths out there about whether or not more crosses in the, your lacing pattern adds up to a stiffer wheel and tools you need. Now this is really useful and you'll see in some videos I'm gonna post because what I've done is I've studied this material I've read this a couple times, um, and then I went down and I basically rebuilt a damaged wheel. I bought a new rim, but I used the existing spokes and hubs. So the new rim is exactly the same as the old rim that was destroyed. So I had kind of an easy go of it, which was a great introduction to building the wheel, getting back into it. He talks about the types of tools you need and stuff you don't need. Then he gives you the, the dimensions and diagrams, patterns to build your own truing stand, which that's the very first thing I did after I bought the book. I'm going, well, isn't that cool? Let's make it. And then he also has a design for building a dishing gauge for making sure the rim is centered in the hub. So I built that too. It, it wasn't hard. I mean, I didn't do the greatest woodworking job ever, but it's perfectly functional and it's cool. You make it yourself. Lots of tips from the maestro. Chapter six, spoke lengths. And then he talks about how he goes about measuring effective rim diameter because according to Roger, 
the ERD effective rim diameter, which is often going to be printed on a label on your rim, is frequently not correct. So, in order to determine the right spoke length you need for the given hub that you bought and the wheel that you, the rim that you bought, you need to do your own measurement. And he tells you this really simple way to do it. I didn't have to do that because I had the spokes. I had the same rim that the spokes were initially, you know, laced into. So I knew it was going to work. Same company. Um, so I had a shortcut there. Um, but he tells you how to do it. He talks about everything you need to know about spokes. If you have different lace spokes, length spokes on the same wheel. Threads, how threads are made, how they're cut, which are good, which are not so good. And then you get to the meat and potatoes bar, chapter seven and eight, lacing the wheel and completing the wheel. The final chapter is repairing wheels, which is basically what I did. And then there's appendix, and the appendix includes a wheel building checklist, which is an eight step, do this, do this, do this, checklist that basically corresponds to the eight steps that you'll get when you read the lacing the wheel chapter. He talks about the geometry of a wheel. He gives you a spoke length calculating uh, tool and he, gives you a mathematical formula that proves the spoke length calculator is correct. Detail upon detail, but it's simple. I mean, you can read it and get it. If you're interested in building a wheel, and I think you should, because I remember when I was just a young guy in a shop learning how to do this. When I built my first wheel, I went, man, that's cool. Now, wheels in those days, and the wheels I was building were probably steel rims and, you know, crappy, you know, hubs and stuff, just stock bikes, you know, you pull it out of the bike from the manufacturer and you build the whole thing, and out it goes onto the showroom floor and you sell it. It was fun, it was really interesting, and it was, it was a great way to spend some time recently again rekindling that interest anyway lacing the wheel begins with record your data so i created a spreadsheet and added it to my existing bike related spreadsheet and it's a way for me to record all the pertinent data you know what hub what's the hub flange measurements What's the offsets of the hub flanges from the center of the hub, etc. Spokes, spoke lengths, uh, all of that stuff. And I added a drive side, non-drive side record of the individual spokes. I was doing a 20 spoke radial laced front wheel. So it's 10 on each side. Super simple. Radial lacing is as simple as it gets. Um, and you can record as I did. Now this is something that Roger will say, you don't need it. You don't need a, a spoke tensiometer. Um, he says, first of all, they're not horribly accurate. Um, secondly, what you want to do is start getting accustomed to tightening the spokes according to the tone that they make when you pluck it, like plucking a guitar string. When you pluck the spoke after it's got sufficient tension, you pluck it up near the nipple, it'll ring. And it's not hard to notice the difference in tone as you pluck, you do all of the spokes on one side, you don't compare it to the sound on the other side. Ding, ding, ding. Ding. You can tell the difference. Tighten that one up because it's a little bit low tone. That means it's not as t not as tight. Um, that's what Roger teaches, and I did that. However, 
I had bought a spoke tensionometer, a digital gauge, and given that it may or may not be accurate so that, you know, the readings you're getting are actual readings, I proceeded on the assumption that if there is an error, it's going to be a repeating error so that I didn't even worry about kilograms and force. I just looked at the deflection measurement that the dial gave me in millimeters. And I recorded all of that for both, all 10 spokes on both sides. I recorded those readings on the wheel that was damaged before I unlaced it. Now that wheel was still in, I rode it into a slot in a concrete drain cover and the bike came to an immediate stop. I didn't hit the ground or anything, but the bike came to an immediate stop and I broke the rim, gashed it, crushed the rim edge. It's a rim brake, carbon rim. I rode the thing to complete my ride, which is about 10 more kilometers, got it home. And I spun the thing after I got it out of the culvert hole. And it was, there was no lateral wobble. There was no hop to it. It was like I just hit a pothole or something. Uh, but it was a huge impact. Well, because it was still looking good, I just took the readings, marked them down, figured out what the average tension was on each side of the wheel. You just add up the individual 10 spokes tensions, average it, do the same thing for the other side. Now the actual tension of all the spokes should be in a range that shouldn't vary more than 20% and ideally a whole lot less, 10%, under 10%. But now I looked at Jim Langley's website and he does a wheel building thing and he says a, a well-built wheel is considered one that doesn't have any more than a 20% variance from the loosest the least tensioned spoke to the highest tension spoke on the same side of the flange, same side of the hub. I figured, well, I wanted to get it better than that. And ideally what you want the average to be pretty much representative of all of the spokes. So I did that with the existing wheel and then as I was building this up, the first thing I did, and Roger will advise you to do the same thing. Um, I put the spokes in the new rim, got the nipples on the way Roger instructs, used the nipple driver the way he said to do it. Um, but I didn't get the feel for that nipple driver right, and I was able to tighten them more than they should have been tightened using that nipple driver. And I don't know how that happened because it's designed so the tab on the end of the screwdriver part, the blade part of the driver, will bottom out on the top of the spoke head. And when it does, if you keep turning, it'll pull that nipple driver out of the slot. You can't tighten it. Well, I, <laughs> Unibaker, Unibiker can figure out ways to defeat the design of the nipple driver, and I did. Anyway, it didn't matter. I was just getting a feel for putting the spokes in there, tightening the nipples on, referring back to his instructions, and then seeing what I ended up with at a certain point. And I had the wheel with quite a decent amount of side-to-side -side lateral play and some hop and I said okay well that was interesting now let's take the nipples off and do it again so I did that the following morning and 
from starting from scratch again, getting the nipples on, tighten them on this time, correctly using the nipple driver, checking the tones of the spokes, making small adjustments all the way around on one side, then on the other side, and getting it to the end of that particular step in his method. Given in a spin, there wasn't much play either way. So I was kind of encouraged. I said, well, yeah, the method works. Um, so then I just followed it step by step. He says, now what you want to do, give each spoke a full turn. So that's one complete revolution of the spoke wrench. Do that all the way around. Recheck the tones, ding, 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 ding. Make small adjustments on any ones that are a little bit off. Um, and if one is particular high note than all the others, then that one would be something that you wanted to slack, give it more slack, undo the tension a little bit. And if it's way low, that's one you wanna turn up the tension a little bit. You do one complete turn with all the spokes. And then he says, now give them all another half turn. Do that. And along the way, he's saying, well, even before you do the full first turn, check the, check the dish on the wheel. So I check it with my tool that Roger taught me how to make. And there wasn't much. There wasn't much at all. There was maybe a millimeter, maybe 1.5, not much. And I figure, okay, he said, don't worry about it. He says, even if there's two to four millimeter at this stage, you're gonna get rid of it as you go through the next stages because you're gonna check it a couple times. So after you do the full turn, check the dish again. It looked pretty good after that. I said, man, that's right on. I just went through his steps. It's a system. The system works. Um, so, completing the wheel. These are the steps in completing the wheel. Lacing the wheel is when you get it to the point where you're now going to start putting tension on the spokes. Step number one, take up the slack. Step number two, align the spokes. Now, that applies to J-bend spokes. Now, I have straight pull hubs, straight pull radial laced hubs. It's kind of idiot proof. And in one of my videos that'll be part of the wheel building post, I mentioned that. I said, well, Duh, now you understand why manufacturers love radial lace, you know, and they do look different, but Roger will tell you they don't do anything different than a J-Bend spoke. And in fact, there may be some shortcomings with straight pull, which we'll discuss, and it's in there. <coughs> Aligning the spokes, step two. When you put the spoke through the hub flange spoke hole and the head catches on the inside or the outside, depending on whether it's an inside spoke or an outside spoke. On the outside spokes, that bend in the neck is gonna create a little bow in the spoke right there on the flange. So what align the spokes amounts to is taking your thumb and putting pressure on those bends to kind of flatten it out against the flange. You want the flange to support as much of that spoke. You don't want the spoke to have a bulge out from the flange like that. You want that spoke to come through and then go straight across the flange. So there's a lot of support for that. So you got to get that bend out of there. You just use your thumb and push it out. It's, that's all there is to it. 
Now step three, take up all of the slack. Tighten the nipples again, half a turn all the way around. So step four, improve the lateral trueness. Now you're at a point as I was where an in between here, he says it, it might be a good idea to check to see if there's dishing errors because if there are, now's the time to try and get most of it out because it gets harder as you put more tension on the spokes. And you're at improve the lateral trueness. So I'm using his um, truing stand now with the gauges, homemade gauges, and I'm checking. There's, there was not much play. There was a little bit. I could see where it would come around and tick, 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 hit the gauge in one spot. So, I mean, that's one thing I remember well from my bike shop days is how to adjust spoke tension to get rid of that sort of play. He discusses it as well and tells you exactly how to do it. So now you just make those spoke tension adjustments to get rid of that play. And then when you're doing that, realize if you're tightening the spoke, what you're also doing is pulling the rim in toward the hub. As you tighten it, it pulls the rim in. So you may end up creating some radial play, what's called wheel hop. So as you're doing the lateral true, you also have to be aware of what effect that's having on the roundness of the rim now. So now adjust the radial trueness. Step six, equalize the spoke tension. Ding, 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 ding. Tighten that. Ding, okay. Ding, ding, ding. Loosen that. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> when you read that, it says, oh, you got to pluck the spokes. You're going, man, that sounds like it's a whole lot less precise than using the tensiometer. Well, Roger says, well, no, it isn't less precise. It's actually more precise. The tensiometers may have reading errors, calibration errors. Just, you don't need it. If you have one, you can use it as I did as kind of a cross-reference. But I would adjust the tone and then check it with the, after I made the adjustment, it sounds good. Let's see if that made a difference. Yeah, it made a difference in the deflection, uh, millimeters of deflection. So that's kind of how I did it. Um, equalize the spoke tensions. Step seven, check the wheel dish again. Out comes the little wheel dishing tool. Take it out of the truing stand, lay it down, check the dish. It was right on. He tells you how to use his tool. And then step eight is the final tensioning. Okay, so you may require more tightening, a little bit of each spoke all the way around. Now what Roger has to say is Manufacturers, rim manufacturers will have a manufacturing recommendation for torque, uh, tightness, KGF, kilograms of force, I guess is what that translates to. And it's usually around 120. Uh, it's different from one side to the other on a rear wheel, but on the front wheel, the hub flanges, there's no offset, so it'd be the same on either side. Um, so once again, I had the easiest intro to wheel building projects here. I had a front wheel, radial spoking, straight pull spokes. Okay, that's about as simple as it gets. Um, so what was I trying to think about? can't remember now. That's the problem with growing up. You start to forget stuff. Oh, yeah, 
manufacturer's tension specifications. He says that's as maybe 120. He says, but carbon rims, modern rims are strong. Okay, very strong. Carbon, really strong. He says you can go over the manufacturer's recommendation and it's going to be fine. Now the the hub specs for the carbon tie hub I have also had spoke tension recommendations. So that's a question I have for Roger now because spoke tension recommendations for the carbon tie hubs are different and lower than the spoke tension recommendations from Far Sports for their rim. Um, so that's something I'm going to toss his way to see how to reconcile those two things, but I don't know. Roger knows. He'll answer my question. What I wound up with, once I finished building the wheel according to Roger's instructions, I again took that meter and measured the deflection of each spoke one through 10 on each side, wrote that down, noted the variance from the least tension spoke to the most tension spoke, and then averaged it, did the same thing for the other side flange. And then I compared those figures to the figures I got before disassembling the damaged rim. My tension was greater than what Far Sports sent me. Um, and I don't think it makes a damn bit of difference. Um, and according to Roger Musson, he says, look, this is not like precision stuff. He says there's a zone of spoke tension and you just need to drop into that zone. Okay, it's not like you have to hit a bullseye target. He says there's an acceptable zone. What you wanna try and do is get all of the spokes the same degree of tension. Okay, that's what you wanna to try to do. If you wanna be more exact, be exact that way. But whether or not, you know, it's 120 or 125 or 128 KGF, there's a zone that you can drop into and the manufacturer's recommendations are on the low end of that zone. And he says, I know from my experience what you can do with any kind of a rim and you can do it, it'll be safe. Wouldn't advise you to do anything that's gonna be dangerous. Um, anyway, I wouldn't have been able to just throw that wheel together based on my recollections of how to do it. Now I remember how we did it and we were doing three cross patterns on heavy steel rims and shit like that. Occasionally, well, I was in one shop I worked in, the other one we were doing more French bikes and Japanese Fujis and stuff like that. So the French bikes had alloy rims, it was better stuff. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do it, I wouldn't have felt comfortable doing it, and I would have run into situations like I ran into on day one when I was just practicing lacing the spokes to the new rim. Um, and then I kind of would have been flummoxed, I'm sure. So I knew I wanted to do it and I wanted to learn how to do it. I wanted to understand the theory of it behind what I'm doing. I mean, you can just read chapter seven and eight and build a wheel Roger Musson style. But why wouldn't you want to read all of this other really interesting data and information that he writes down? He says, I'm not hiding anything. This is everything I know. And if you do what I say, you're going to know everything about a wheel just like I do. Uh, he says, there's stuff to learn, but you can learn it. 
So it's kind of a cool approach, a good teaching approach. Anyway, I don't earn a penny by selling Rogers books. I'm just telling you, if you're interested in building a wheel, there's probably no better, simpler printed resource. Now you can watch Jim Langley build a wheel on his site and Jim knows how to do it. And he does it a little bit different. Um, but it's, it's not fundamentally different. It may be slightly different in where the first spoke goes or something, you know, but probably not even. Um, I've seen Roger actually on a video lacing a wheel, 32 spoke wheel, and it's broken down into eight spokes. You do the eight spokes on the drive side, you do the eight spokes on the non-drive side, and those are the pulling spokes. Rotate the hub away from the valve hole, do the eight other spokes on the drive side that are going to be the pushing spokes, and then the eight other spokes on the non-drive. He does it at it's about five minute long video. He says, doing what I just did, he says, you should be able to do this in 10 minutes. Once you understand what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish lacing, that's the simplest part of the build. Um, the steps of basically, you know, after that are not more difficult, it's just, you know, this is where you're getting into making the wheel so you can get on it and ride it. Anyway, um, that's my report on Roger's book. Uh, what's it called again? Wheel Building, The Professional Guide to Wheel Building by Roger Musson, 7th edition. You can find it on the internet. If you want to build a wheel, you ought to do it. Anyway, thanks for listening to me jabber away about my little project. I appreciate it.